Hi everyone, my name is Rachel Marks and I'm the Director of Education here at Sunray. We help thousands of general contractors, subcontractors, and suppliers secure their lien and bond claim rights. Sunray secures over $10 billion annually. Today's webinar is conducted by the incredible Lynn Thompson, a Mississippi construction lien law guru. Today's webinar's topic is, don't sign a release unless it says this one thing. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the fabulous Lynn Thompson. Hello, everybody. I'm very glad you could join us today. Um, I enjoy being put on a pedestal by my friends at Sunray. Um, that's always good. Let me just tell you a few housekeeping um, items. Um, if you have any questions during um, the uh, webinar, go to the webinar chat box. It's on the right. You can put your question in there. Questions will be answered at the end. And please, um, just to be discreet, don't include any names or company names in your questions. Um, and we're going to get right to the meat of the coconut. All right. Um, Y'all work and I work in an industry uh, that is filled with conflict. And today's presentation covers those sorts of documents that are meant to get co uh, conflict resolved, to take a uh, disputed matter and get it to an end or an undisputed matter and make sure it doesn't become a disputed matter down the line. Um, what I'm talking about are releases. And generally a release is a waiver by the people that sign it um, to known or in some cases even unknown causes of actions, claims, or rights. And according to the terms of the waiver, if it's signed, um, you won't be able to bring those causes of actions or claims via arbitration or litigation after that date. So these are very important documents that require close reading and rereading each time. And provided the waiver is supported by adequate consideration, it is highly unlikely you'll be able to undo its terms. So again, read and reread. Um, there are some uh, avenues under Mississippi law to allow you to get out of the terms of a waiver, but they involved um, claims such as mutual mistake or unilateral mistake or unconscionability. Um, and I will just tell you those include very um, difficult elements to meet. So you need to be able to live with what you sign. Now, there are lots of different types of waivers and releases. And the first two I'm going to cover are in the ordinary course of business. When you are simply submitting an application for payment, whether you are the prime contractor or a subcontractor or a supplier, um, this is the ordinary course of uh, waiver and release submission. So this is instances when there are no disputes on the horizon or no, no existing disputes. You're simply turning in a standard interim request for payment. Now, if you don't remember from previous webinars, I'll remind you that under Mississippi law, payment is deemed made if a notice of non-payment or a lien is not filed within 60 days of the date of the lien release or waiver even if you've not been paid. So don't forget that very important rule. You will lose your lien right. So when you're executing uh, just an interim or partial release for payment, um, make sure the release states the actual date of the signature. And then don't let it sit on someone's desk or in their uh, inbox on their email. You need to transmit that uh, waiver and release that day to the owner or the prime contractor or subcontractor, wherever you are in the tier of construction, you need to get it out that day. Um, then you need to set in diary multiple reminders for that 60 day deadline, um, 45 days, 50 days. Um, what you may not know is to file a notice of non-payment or a lien, you've got to get it to the right land records office. That may be in some faraway county in Mississippi from where your lawyer is. It's going to take some travel time and make sure they get it to the right place. So you need to calendar with sufficient time to get a notice of affidavit prepared or a lien claim um, prepared and filed in the proper office. 
and then you need to make certain that the release states the date through which it applies. Um, typically, this is the end date of the period that's covered by the invoice. It's not the same date that you execute the uh, waiver or the release. Um, and I will show you all a suggested form. In fact, if you look at Mississippi statutes, this is um, a suggested form of a um, waiver and release for payment. And like I said, don't get sloppy with it and let it sit around. You need to make sure that it states the date that you signed it, send it out that date, and be certain it states the date for the period that it covers. Now, what happens if you're in the middle of a project and some dispute has arisen? It could be as to the delivery time. It could be as to extra work that's had to be done, um, a delay by another subcontractor or a delay by the prime or even the owner. Um, in this situation, take a look at that um, waiver and release form. And if you know that you have claims that you want to assert, maybe not at that very moment, but you need to preserve them, have a couple of things that you can do. Um, and that is modify the release form. You can identify the claims uh, for which notice um, is being reserved. Or you can state in the waiver of lien that it extends only to the amount of funds received and waives no claim or right as to any other amounts that um, may be due or become due. A couple of ways you can preserve that. And I say this because a release is in itself a form of contract. And courts may not look beyond the contract document itself to, um, to see what it includes or doesn't include. So if you're counting on separate letters giving notices of claims to reserve your claim rights, it's better to reference the claim in the release itself than rely later on uh, on a letter that you sent that was never mentioned in this release or waiver. So this is more of a belt and suspenders approach, but, but I highly recommend it. Um, if any of you do work for the uh, federal government, you will know that whatever is stated in a modification counts as that contractual agreement. And unless claims are expressly reserved in their waiver and release forms or modifications, then you will not um, be able to preserve that claim. And I think at the state law level, um, that same situation could apply. Now, final payment, um, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, make sure that the release states the actual date of the signature. Again, even for final payment, Mississippi law deems you to have been paid if you do not file the notice of non-payment or file a claim of lien within 60 days of the date that you execute uh, the uh, waiver and release. So again, don't let it sit in your desk drawer. Most people don't, but it does happen. Um, and diary uh, multiple reminders for that 60 day deadline so that you don't miss it. Now, I will say this, if you look at this form for the final, uh, final payment waiver and release. And if we were to look back at the interim or partial payment waiver and release, uh, under Mississippi law, you would see this, uh, this notice. And what it says is, uh, the failure to include this notice language on the face of the form shall render the form unenforceable and invalid as a waiver and release under, and it gives the Mississippi code section. So if you are the party that is seeking signature on a waiver or release form. If you're operating in Mississippi on a project, use this uh, notice. You, the one thing you need to make sure is included uh, before you send it out for signature is this notice so that it has the operation of cutting off lien claims that's intended by the statute. And if there is a dispute concerning a final payment, then 
it's the same as with a, uh, an, an interim or partial release payment. And that is identify on the final payment waiver and release any claims that you want to preserve. Or another option is don't execute this as a final release, but simply execute it as another partial or interim release and note in the release um, that the waiver of lien or claim of lien extends only to the amount of funds actually received. And you can list um, the, uh, the claims that are to be preserved. So you don't have to accept it as a final release. Um, that may be difficult with whomever you're, you're contracting, but convert it to an interim if possible, or at a minimum, preserve your claims. Now, not all the waivers and releases that you'll be asked to um, execute had to do with a payment application. You may have actually gotten into a dispute um, during the course of a project. Uh, it may have gone to litigation or it may have been resolved prior to litigation or arbitration, but these are very, very important documents as well. Okay, now it's hard to say that there's ever just one thing that a uh, waiver or release should include before you sign it. So what I've done is look at some, um, some provisions uh, because waivers and releases may come up in different situations and depending on the nature of the dispute or the nature of the release itself, I have some suggestions. For instance, the first one, if you're asked to execute um, or you want someone to execute an absolute waiver and release, then a couple of things you want to include, be sure to include. One is make it mutual. If you're giving up all of your rights, you want them to be doing the same. So it needs to have a mutuality provision for an absolute waiver and release. Another thing is don't admit any liability. Um, typically you can include um, provisions state that it's purely a, um, to resolve a dispute. It's a matter of business judgment and not an admission of liability. And what this can do is it keeps anyone from using that absolute waiver and release against you, not just the party with whom the release is executed, but against other parties who may look in it for an admission of liability and um, use that to assert some claim against you. For instance, there are a couple of subcontractors. Um, and if one executes a waiver and release with the prime contractor, and admits some liability for a delay or defective product or installation, another subcontractor may be able to rely on that to prove a claim against you. Um, so it's simply uh, very important to say that there's no admission of liability. Um, the second one on this slide is there needs to be a clear and unambiguous identification of any claims not included in a release. Sometimes either one or both parties to a waiver and release um, don't want to um, identify all of the claims that are included in it, or they simply can't. Perhaps it's too soon during the course of a project to do that, um, or they want to resolve litigation or arbitration, but not foreclose the possibility that some unforeseen condition may come up later. And that's legitimate. So if you're being asked to um, identify claims that are not included or just you want some assurance that everything that is known is included, then you can um, include provisions that say that all the claims have been disclosed as of the date that the waiver or release is signed um, and that there is no knowledge of any existing potential or threatened claims um, that arise out of the um, of the party's relationship. Um, and if you're gonna do that, then you need to, to make have each party verify that they're not aware of any claims. Um, so if you're including claims, whether known or unknown, um, you need to make each party stipulate or agree that they're not aware of the basis for a claim. But I can tell you, um, from practical experience, I have seen this um, very crafty folks can get around this and they immediately go out and or have already hired an expert and the expert comes out after 
the waiver and release is signed and finds, you know, lo and behold, um, dozens of defects for which a later claim is made. And if your language isn't just right in your waiver and release, these claims that they probably knew about but didn't advise you of or were sus suspected they had claims and checked them out immediately after the waiver was signed, that waiver and release may not give you the protection that you were expecting. So one suggestion would be uh, to include as a term of that waiver and release a requirement that if after the date of execution, one or the other parties uh, hires an expert to come and look at suspected um, problems with construction or installation or a product, that the other party to that waiver and release must be notified and be able to participate. Um, it can be kind of difficult to hold people to the representation that they were not aware of a claim when in fact that they were, but this will be one way of uh, trying to um, forestall that, that kind of gotcha after you think you've gotten something taken care of. And again, as with any other waiver and release related to a dispute, be sure that there's no admission of liability. Okay, suppose the, um, the dispute that you've been in has been um, involved um, information that you really don't want to get out into your industry or just out into the domain of the of the public, um, it may be, if not embarrassing, it could um, certainly be just involve details or facts or people that you don't want discussed. And and each party to a waiver and release may may desire this. So you need to consider whether your release and waiver should state that it's confidential or non-confidential. You can certainly agree to keep an agreement private. However, it shouldn't be so private or confidential that you're not allowed to disclose it to any governing authorities um, that may be necessary for tax purposes or regulatory purposes. Um, so you need to make sure that there's some wiggle room for you to be able to comply with the law. Um, and you can also include a requirement that if you are requested by a third party to turn over any information that the waiver or release would say uh, is confidential, that you have to give written notice to the other party. Um, and that way, parties um, are apprised of potential disclosures of their information. Another thing you want to consider, um, and this is uh, particularly useful if it's a bonded project or if the project involves some construction defect and your insurer was involved in a, under a reservation of rights or maybe even under a, um, a, a, a covered claim, or you have particular individuals who, um, whose involvement in the project or the disputed aspect of it that you wanna protect. Um, make sure your waiver or your release includes these entities and or people by name, you know, your surety, your insurer, and individuals that could be owners, um, you know, managers, other subcontractors. Um, make sure that you look closely um, if you're the one signing the release and waiver, make sure who all is included. And if you're the person that is seeking to have the other party sign the waiver or release, um, make sure it doesn't include um, entities or people that are that you really don't intend to release. Um, a non-disparagement clause. I see these more and more in um, waivers and releases that that are as part of the settlement of disputes. Um, and it's that you know one that the parties will not disparage the other in terms of their quality of work, their business reputation their uh, financial stability. Uh, it's kind of a, you know, don't ask, don't tell sort of, sort of thing. But I've also seen it go be expressed so broadly that you're terrified to say a single word. Um, so if, you've, if you are including or trying to resist a non-disparagement clause, make sure you're very aware of its breadth and that you don't set um, a trap you know, for the unwary. Um, and if you include a non-disparagement clause, be sure to instruct 
everyone top to bottom of your organization um, as to what that um, what the requirements are. And then finally, because it's hard to say that there's ever an ironclad agreement that's never been challenged. I don't know that such a thing exists. So if there's one thing you want to be sure to include in a waiver or a release is that if if one or the other party has to resort to attorney's fees to, to legal counsel or to a legal proceeding to enforce it, then they've got to pay the fees. Um, and that could be on a, they pay them with, if they lose their challenge to the waiver and release, um, or simply the fact that they brought the proceeding to enforce it. But if you've used these documents for their purpose, which is to resolve disputes, you know, put these dis, uh, disagreements in a can and leave them be, but then you have to open that can again, then you'd like to be able to have a provision that allows you to collect attorney's fees. Under Mississippi law, typically attorney's fees are not permitted to be awarded unless they are expressly agreed to in a contract um, or if um, bad faith uh, entitles you to, um, to, to receive an award of attorney's fees. So it's hard to say that there's one thing for every settlement and release. These are some of the bigger items and you may care more about some than others depending on the um, how difficult the dispute has been, the dollar value involved either in the dispute or the settlement. Um, if you dealt with parties uh, before, um, you know, you, you tend to uh, lose the edge in, in what it is you want to include. So it may depend on if you've had multiple courses of dealings with the party that's executing uh, the waiver or release, but um, there's no one size fits all. So, um, just make sure that every waiver and release is tailored to the situation. And if there are any questions, um, I'll turn those over to Rachel. Thank you so much, Lynn, for your time this afternoon and educating us on this very important topic. Uh, you provided super, super helpful, and very detailed um, information that is extremely valuable. So we really appreciate your time today. Uh, as for questions, I do not see any questions that have come through. However, if anyone here does think of a question after the webinar, please feel free to reach out to myself or Lynn, and we will make sure to answer any questions that you may have. Um, if you could just go to the next slide for me, please. Okay, so if everyone would like to take a moment and review us on Google, we would appreciate that. And then if you go to the next slide, please. Okay, so let's talk about our um, next webinar with Lynn. So that will be on Thursday, September 28th from 12.30 to 12.50 Eastern Standard Time. You can register for this live webinar at sunraynotice.com slash education. And the title is Getting Paid Faster with Liens, Bonds, and Contracts. And if you go to the next slide. And that's really all that we have for you today. So I hope that everyone has a sunny day and we hope to see you on our next webinar. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Rachel. Bye-bye.